thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is the How Deep Is Your Music Strategy panel and we're here today to talk all about music and brand partnerships. Uh, my name is Lara Baker, I'm a music industry marketing and events consultant from London and we have a great panel here who are all experts and specialists in music and brand partnerships and I'll ask them to introduce themselves in just a moment. So a bit of context for this panel, brand partnerships have long been an important part of the mix for artists, offering both profile building opportunities and a really important revenue stream. Over the years, we've seen music and brand partnerships develop depth beyond simple endorsements and badging of tours to much more in-depth partnerships and the most effective campaigns involve the artist creatively and authenticity is key. We've talked a lot about authenticity in our meeting beforehand, so I'm sure that will be a big theme today. We've also entered an era where there's more data available than ever data on an artist's fan base, so where they're based, what they're listening to, what are their buying habits, and also data on the brand side as to who their audience is and their market. And that makes for a really interesting time where brands and music can really pick the right partners and measure the success of their partnerships. So we're gonna dig into how you have an effective brand partnership, and also, I guess, what things to avoid and, and where things can go wrong. So I'm gonna start by asking the panel to introduce themselves. Hello everybody, my name is Chris Clark. I'm the director of music at uh, for the Leo Burnett Group based in Chicago, and thank you guys for coming. Hi, uh, my name is Gary Cohen, and I am the brand partnership director at ATC. We're a management company based out of London and LA. Hi everyone, my name is Nadia. I run uh, my own artist management company called CTRL Management, and uh, I manage various artists, predominantly from like the urban UK grime scene. I manage Lethal Bizzle for fifteen years, and I've got some really cool upcoming female artists I work with as well. Um, hello, my name is Judith Messier, and I'm the founder of Rebellion.com, which is a music licensing and sync company. Uh, we work we work mainly with uh, music outside the Western world, so. Brazilian music, um, Russian music, but we concentrate on African music, that's our speciality, and I run that in partnership with Sony Music in the UK. Fantastic, and if any of you guys want to meet the panel today, at the end of this session, we'll be going through that door just over there for a meet the speakers session. Okay, so I think a good place to start would be to define what a brand partnership means to a marketer, to an artist, and to an audience. Um, when we spoke about this in advance, Chris, you had some interesting thoughts on that. Do you want to kick things off? Yeah, I think it's really interesting to break this down between the actual the brand and the marketing side, myself from an agency perspective, uh, how an artist views the word partnership, and then also as a consumer, we can all think of ourselves as consumers when we see brands and artists matched up um, and how we perceive that to be a partnership or not. It's from a client standpoint in the work that I do with them, it's often you have a creative concept and then you end up getting to some type of deal points that you want to put together contractually. So a client really is going to look at this partnership as how long you know, what am I getting? What am I offering to the artist? Uh, and it kind of has a fixed um, uh, lifespan to it. But from an artist, I had a, a, a very unique instance where we just licensed a song for a new Samsung commercial with the slow motion feature. We did a license with an artist named Stella Mwenge. Uh, and the artist who uh, is putting out some uh, incredible new kind of swagger rap type music. She actually looked at this sync license as a partnership. She actually checked on Instagram paid partnership with Samsung, which technically wasn't true. Um, and I, I actually had to ask her people to uncheck it, but her enthusiasm for a license um, and for what the brand was doing to give her song a platform actually created interest with Samsung Europe and specifically Samsung Norway, where she's from. And they're now in talks for some type of local, potentially a local partnership or some sort of way. I think we're actually going to bring her to perform at the Lions Festival here in Cannes in two weeks. So the artist looked at a license as a partnership and now it's starting to like have an additional life to it, which I think is really interesting. And I'd be curious from a consumer perspective, how you guys look at um, what is an actual partnership? What's just a contract? 
Um, and uh, from an artist perspective, like what does it actually mean? So what do brands look to get from a music partnership? When they're, when they're picking an artist, when they're going into a, a music partnership, what, what are they looking for? I think it depends. I honestly have had uh, brands not as interested in a straight up partnership because I think it's hard for brands to commit um, outside of certain categories like fashion, uh, footwear, etc. It's hard to say, I'm going to stick with this artist specifically for a long period of time. Uh, and I think that we'll get some insights from our uh, earlier discussion just on how brands are doing this a little bit differently um, with artists. But it's, they're always going to be looking at, you know, what is the shared audience? How does the artist share their values as a brand between the two brands? Um, and then what, what collectively can they do for each other? A lot of brands ignore stuff like that. But it's my p job to make sure that the brand understands it's not just asking for 10 social posts and a photo shoot with an artist. The relationship should go a little bit uh, deeper than that. Mm. Judith, did you have something you wanted to jump in with that? Um, yeah, I, I agree with Chris. And it, it depends on the brand itself. Um, some, some brands are very integrated and that's part of their strategy, such as Nando's and Red Bull, who are one of our, the brands that we work with, is very much integrated. They have a Red Bull studio in London where um, artists can come in, use their studios. It's very authentic and it's very real. Whereas with other brands, it's kind of like we're just trying to jump on the cool bandwagon. You're the next hot artist, you know, um, do a rap for us for our new product. And it comes out really terribly. Mm. So um, as an artist, you have to first assess where you are as, a, as an artist, where in your career you are. Um, if you're sort of just starting out um, as an artist, you probably looking for ways in which the brand can help you with not just uh, monetary wise, but like um, in terms of exposure, in terms of mm. more um, showcases down the line. Um, and um, I think you were saying earlier as well, you work with up and coming artists. So you look at studio space because for them, a brand giving you studio space isn't expensive for them. So they, they don't mind doing that and that cut, cut your costs as well. So when you're starting out, you have to look at different um, avenues to work with a brand, not just money wise. Mm. Yeah, I was just going to say from my perspective, obviously, having, working with a really established artist and working with new up and coming emerging artists, the kind of deals that I would look to do um, for both those category of artists are completely different. And I've seen them change over the years. So um, in terms of what brands look for, um, I think they could either be looking to do something that is like a cultural um, reason for doing this to kind of associate their brand with something or it could be um, a basic like financial deal in terms of here's a fee and we want to get, you know reach your social fan base that could be with like bloggers or music artists that have a high social media following um, typically previous brand deals that we would have done would have been like a longer kind of commitment um, sign up with the fee and then there's like lots of social media posts um, involved with that and lots of deliverables um, with newer emerging artists, as you touched on, Judith, like, I've found that I've been able to actually create brand partnerships with my newer artists, which is really important because I think it's really difficult for, for newer artists to maybe have avenues to kind of get out there and financially have difficulty. So there are brands out there that are willing to work with more new up and coming and emerging artists. Like you said, for example, Nando's, um, I've got one of my female artists and, you know, we, we use their space in exchange for, um, like some social media posts, etc., and it's about building a longer term relationship with a brand like that, or um, with Red Bull or Relentless. Again, they have music studio spaces available, um, and I can go to them with like individual projects, and they are willing to work with like smaller emerging artists. Yeah, I mean, I just uh, well, I suppose I'd add that in the general landscape, uh, relationships with brands have almost become the second biggest revenue stream for artists after touring because they're not making much money from releasing recorded music. We, we tend to look at three things. Uh, the fee obviously is a factor. Uh, we look at the reach of the brand and the numbers and stats behind that reach mm. and whether that there's a compatibility there. But the third thing that where there's been a big increase is brands helping artists to bring a creative vision to life. 
Um, so, for example, we manage Johnny Marr. We want to get Johnny into the whole streaming programming space. Mm. We have a concept that messaging behind that concept suits a particular brand. Mm. So we're in talks with that brand at the moment to mm. fund the production of, of, this, of the series. Mm. Okay. So when a brand partnership is starting, what, um, what data is a, a brand looking at from the artist? Will, will they sort of look at all their social stats and will they ask for any other data? I think they'll def definitely just look into like a social media reach. I wouldn't say that they would ask up front. Uh, they kind of look at the figures that are available to them, like the followers, the engagement of that. And like you said at the start, I think that's um, information that's more readily available to brands now. So they um, kind of have clearer objectives of what they want as results um, or what they would expect. So obviously social media posts are usually tied into um, as part of the deal. But I would say different ways that we work with brands as well is like um, um, it, they're based on the commitment that we do with them. So like on a, a basis level, but on the basic level, we could start and do a brand partnership in terms of like some product placement within a video. And that's something that I would do as like my most common kind of used brand placement because it's quite straightforward in terms of a deal, in terms of what the brand wants to get out of it and what we, we want to get out of it. So it might mean that we would get um, some funds and in return we would use a product um, within a video or wear a piece of clothing within a video. Um, and that's like a really easy, simple transaction for us to do. Um, one thing you know that I did to say um, earlier when we spoke was that the most important thing for me with and my artists as well is just to really keep it authentic. So you know I'm not going to do a deal with a yogurt brand. You know him me in yogurt that doesn't anything fit. So it's just going to look really see through to his fans and be really obvious that this is just like a paid partnership. So it's really important for us to do more organic. Um, brand deals and I think um, as things have moved forward I think brands are more open to us now like you said pitching creative ideas to them and I think sometimes when the ideas come from the artist it's going to work better on their socials and have a bigger reach which is going to have the right effect that the brand you know want to get out of the whole activity in the first place. I think streaming platforms have changed the game in terms of data so for example on Spotify we as the management get a hot city map so we get the top 50 cities around the world while the song's being streamed. Mm. That's really valuable for us to be able to share with brands. Mm. So pretty much data across all the platforms and all the social as well. Mm. And uh, um, I think it's important to distinguish whether sometimes a brand wants to work with a particular artist, but sometimes they just want to work with a scene and they want to jump on a scene that is hot. For example, um, right now in the UK, the grime scene is hot and you have a lot of brands who just want to jump on the grime scene and just grab anybody from the grime scene to work with them and it doesn't really matter about their socials so much um, unless you're like a um, especially if you're up and coming um, so that's that's something to be really cautious about when a brand just wants to jump on the scene that's where you get the in authenticity if I said that right mm. um, and you have to be really careful so you need to look at that when the brand comes to you so how do you identify the right brand for your artist to work with? Do you, do you draw up a list of brands that feel like the right fit or do brands come to you and how do you evaluate whether it would be a good fit or not? Well, when I started at ATC, I actually sat down with the artists and asked them what do they wear, what tech do they use. Mm. So we knew, so that's the first point, can the artist genuinely stand over the fact that they're interested in the product mm. um but also match we did a deal recently with sailor jerry it's a rum brand it's all about tattoos and music mm. we had uh, we managed frank carter and the rattlesnakes frank as well as the lead singer is also a renowned tattoo artist mm. so we were able to see that, and, and that deal literally came about just because of that fact yeah um so you do it's really the credibility and whether the artist is comfortable standing over it that's about as authentic as it gets <laughs> how, how can you tell when it's not how can you spot perhaps an offer that you're getting that's that's not going to work that's not going to be a good fit i think we was talking about this before there's so many examples of bad brand partnerships uh, we could be here all day um i don't know share some with us <laughs> or do you not want to 
No, no we, we, we spoke about the whole, um, not Taylor Swift, what's the, Kendall Jenner yep. and the Pepsi ad and how that was very inauthentic and it just didn't make any sense. But then you have um, the recent Nike ad um, that they did with the whole grime team that was really well researched and really well mm. um, put together. And then you have artists who will remain nameless who just kind of do brand deals off the brand deals off the brand deals and they become more um, known for their brand deals and their music. Um, part of that is for them, the artists, to stay relevant and in the public eye because there's certain things that happen behind the scenes that you can't see. This this particular artist, she was in a legal battle with her record label, so she couldn't release any more music. So she had to do brand partnerships to keep her her name out there. Mm. But um, the problem was that it backfired, and people only know her for her brand deals and not her music. Mm. So sometimes you don't know what's going on behind the scenes, so it's easy to criticize. But if if a brand comes to you and you just don't feel like it's the right thing to do, if you you don't feel like it's the right thing to do everyone else will see through it um if you don't use their products if you don't use their brand then like it's going to be so see-through but when you use it and it's part of the scene and you know like nike and the grime scene like um london kids have grown up with nike we don't even call it nike a uh, nike we call it nike like mm -hmm. like we've grown up with it and for them to like partner partner with that scene was so authentic but i suppose if like a brand like i don't know I don't know, whatever comes, then it just seems inauthentic. I've seen some really bad partnership deals done, especially, like you said, in, within the grime scene, um, where you can really clearly see that it's not authentic. And um, I think sometimes that's a challenge for the artist, because obviously if you're an upcoming, you know, independent artist and you get offered a sum of money, and um, uh, this particular one was to create a track for this drinks product, and um, it got received really, really badly on social media where everyone was like, oh, you clearly got paid to do this. You, you're not in, interested in this product and it's really embarrassing. And the artist had to um, put messages out on social media, kind of defending themselves, saying, well, I got paid you know, so much and there's an advertising campaign on radio. They really felt like they had to defend themselves. But that's like a really clear example of something that just shows that it was just like a monetary transaction and the brand didn't get what they wanted out of it um, and the artist you know is kind of um, ridiculed so I think for me when we're choosing brand partnerships it's really important it's a good fit for the artist and um, my artists specifically that I look after are really proactive on social media and their personalities are really clear um, for their fan base to see so they're gonna not buy into anything you know we don't do tagged posts on on social media we avoid all that and if it was just a financial thing we could go ahead and um just rake in all these deals but they would just be so inauthentic and they wouldn't work for the brand and they wouldn't work for the artists either and a, a question to you quickly then then as a artist manager when you say for example you did a brand deal and it goes sour how do you go about clean that cleaning that up so, sort of thing and correcting the Sour in terms of backlash from yeah backlash or well, he sign the contract. <laughs> like, there's nothing you can do. No, in terms of like in terms of like PR and how would you like handle it? Do you think he handled that the right way in terms of saying, oh, I got paid this much? I don't know. Like, could some artists have an ego and like, oh, you guys are broke. I got paid for it at least. Do you know what I mean? Like, as an I think he did. Yeah, well, all he could do. Do you know what I mean? I don't. I don't manage that specific artist, but I just think. Um, yeah, I think he was in a in in a not a great position because he'd done a deal that just totally backfired on him. So you know, maybe if I was speaking to him beforehand, I would have been like, you know, the money's great or whatever. You know, you're getting it seems great, but is it worth it for you? So I think as an artist, you kind of need to to weigh up all those factors rather than just just jumping into any deal. And as I just mentioned before as well, um, I think you know, speaking your voice to a brand and and saying, well, you know what, I don't think this will necessarily work. How about this? And see if the brand is willing to have a conversation um, and look at things from your perspective to explain that this is going to get the best results for them as well. You, that... you never really know, but the, the easiest way to try and make it feel and look authentic is to get the artist involved in contributing to the... That's going to, to be my next the... question, actually. Yeah. So how, how often does that happen? When a, when a brand is putting together a campaign, how... How often does the artist get to have an input? And are there any examples where that's been done really well? Um, well, we, we we tend to bring the artist to the table pretty early. 
uh, and and the brands love that. Uh, how much input they can actually have in the, the final messaging depends brand to brand to brand. But I was just gonna say, <clears throat> but it's ideal for the artist to be able to review and approve. You know, maybe not approve, but at least review and know what's about to go out to the world. Um, or, or what's going to end up being done. Because I think there's probably a lot of people in the room who are an artist or representing an artist. Um, mm. So the most important thing that anyone on an agency or marketer side that we're going to be looking for is like, what are you or your artist or your scene doing culturally that if we're doing it right, we're not just borrowing interest in your voice or the voices. Um, that are having an impact culturally. That's what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. But then ideally, you have discussions, you have collaboration. Um, from my end, if I sniff out that the client is just demanding that they want five things done and they don't really want the artist's voice and the artist's team involved, then I should probably kill that deal before it goes down because it's it's going to lend itself to... Uh, n not having consumer appeal, which is the entire point of what we're trying to do. I've, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I'm not, I'm not going to go ahead with a deal that doesn't feel like it's a right fit for the artist and if the artist is not excited by it because I'm going to be the middle person that's going to be trying to get these deliverables achieved and the artist just has no passion about it and that's when it's just going to be shown as really mm. inauthentic. So I see myself as the person that kind of has to really kind of speak to the brand and kind of give them the artist perspective and their point of view so that we can make the campaign really cool and credible yeah. um, and just kind of being really creative with the ideas that you that you pitch with brands. So for example, um, we like release a lot of our music independently um, over the years um, there was a track called Rory Workout, which has like, got 10 million views, the video on, on uh, YouTube. And we wanted to do a collaboration because we're independent and we're funding it all ourselves. So we wanted to get some funding for the video. So we reached out to this app that was a, a new app developing where they kind of wanted to, um, it was called Ping Tune, where I think people just like shared music and they were trying to like condense all um, the different social media sharing apps into one. Um, and they approached us and said, look, we're interested in doing something. So I sat down with the artist and was like, how can we make this work? And what can I go back to them with that's gonna fit for you? So I said, look, you know, we want some funding for the video. Um, what do you guys wanna get out of this? So they wanted obviously some social media posts, some media interviews, and um, a picture, an image of him using the app within the video. Um, and it worked really, really well for us um, because you know there was the financial transaction involved there, but they also really supported us in terms of being able to, especially as independent, like giving us like a team that can create assets for us. So during that particular song, Rory Workout, we had a big social media campaign where we had lots of fans sending videos in of them like doing a dance to the song and um, us being independent, we didn't have a huge team um, to create social media assets or websites or, or the budget for those kind of things. So they provided all that budget, built a website for us and um, provided loads of assets that, you know, was really helpful to us to actually pr help promote the campaign as well. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I think, the I may be wrong, but I think the bigger the brand is, the the easier it, it gets um, for your voice or to be like diluted down and died on because there's so much hierarchy and you have to... Um, get an okay from a higher up and then another okay from a higher up and a higher up so um even though there's more money involved with a bigger brand it's easy to lose your voice and your authenticity so um i think before you you sort of think about um working with a brand just know where your boundaries are because it can easily be pushed especially when they're offering you quite a bit, quite a lot of money when you're an independent artist and you need that for you know studio time and Mm. music videos and stuff like that it's easy for it to get swayed and that's when you kind of pick up bad deals and it goes wrong um, as well I think yes yeah, it's, it's important not to just look at it like I said as a financial transaction and really get the brand to clearly state what the deliverables are and think it through practically because after you get the check this campaign might be rolling on for a month or two months where the artist got to continually post and you really need to get the deliverables laid out clearly like how many social media posts what is the copy that you want to do are you going to allow us to have an input in that because um, you know that's where it's just gonna like make everything 
kind of not work for the brand, not work for the artist, where they're not going to be interested in, in posting those kind of things. Yeah, um, sorry, one quick, the copy is really important as well because well, the brand might, might want you to post something very specifically and that's, it's just so different from your own natural voice of posting on Instagram or Twitter. It's like, you can see that there's a difference whereas some brands will just let you post whatever but as long as you just put the brand name then that's fine. So yeah, that's important. I'd like to pick up on your earlier point about um, sort of small artists and what they get out of working with brands and also sort of in reverse, some brands do go for smaller, newer artists. Uh, is that always just for financial reasons or how, how do sort of brand partnerships come about when the artist is really new or not very well known? I tend to find when it's a uh, breakthrough artists are looking for it, it is budgetary reasons. Um, but on saying that, a lot of brands now are genuinely trying to get into the culture of breaking new bands. So mm -hmm. a lot of brands have built brand spaces. So we've the House of Vans, mm -hmm. Relentless have one, where they've got studios and all that sort of stuff. So it, it all depends. But mainly I've found it's budgetary when they're looking for breakthrough artists. They don't really care. They'd love that artist to break big, but they're not really that invested in, in, in doing so. And I think that's, that's a really important distinction in that the age of, you know, we're going to have a long-term or even a six to 12 month brand partnership. Um, it still happens for A and B list type of artists because of the, the appeal and the audience that they have, and there needs to be a good, solid fee and all that. But, um, Brands are helping to build infrastructure around scenes, which I think we all I think that's an interesting place. You talk about just from a revenue standpoint, brands can be the second uh, most important sh revenue stream for artists. Like that's where it can make sense for a brand because they say this scene or this genre or or whatever on a local or larger like territorial perspective, we get behind this. And we don't have to, frankly, you don't have to worry about, is this artist going to be relevant after X amount of time? Because you're really supporting the character and the ethos of a type of music or a type of artist that comes up and believes a certain thing and their voice represents something. And I think there's, especially if they're pumping money into the infrastructure to support artists, that's an interesting type of part. It's like it's multiple partnerships or platforms that they're giving a bunch of different artists. They're spreading the money around to emerging artists that maybe need some support, but it doesn't need to be on a consistent recurring basis unless the brand sees enough value in it. Uh, but I think that that's, if that's a trend, then that's a, that's a good trend for music culture. Yeah. I think for, if there's any artists out there, don't just go to a brand and say, can we have some money please? Because they get swamped. Have an idea. And, and understand what that brand's messaging is and what sort of unique angle you could bring to that. that that's the trick. And the other thing for Breakthrough Artists then, the big thing is sync because mm. you can bring your music to a much, much bigger audience very quickly uh, through a brand piece of activity. Mm. So I wanna, I'm conscious we're running out of time. I want to raise um, the subject of kind of new technology and how that can be part of a brand partnership. So we've talked about various elements of partnerships, things like brands asking for tweets, uh, product placement in videos, we've talked about sync. Um, are any brand and music partnerships doing anything interesting with new technology, with, with VR, with live streaming? Have you seen any, any cool examples of that sort of thing? Yeah, we just did a thing last week. We managed this girl, Alma, uh, who's broken through big time. And she had a gig in London, and we live streamed it over Facebook with Skull Candy. Um, we have uh, uh, the the AR VR thing is 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 huge now. Uh, so a lot of the tech companies are looking to use music to demonstrate that capability. So the first big thing was uh, Coachella this year. Eminem did a big uh, VR experience, but we're working with All J. Uh, and a VR experience for two shows they're doing at the Royal Albert Hall in October. Um, all of them, pretty much Google, Microsoft, all of them are getting into that space and using music to demonstrate their capabilities. Mm. Cool. 
Anyone else got any examples of? Um, I know um, Boiler Room um, have launched a new platform online where they they show concerts live and you can watch it from wherever you are in the world. They, they're very global. And so I have um, Ballantine, which is a, a drink alcohol I don't know whether it's whiskey or gin or whatever mm. but they're doing lots of like um, global music initiatives and they're going um, to different um, countries in Africa not just like the usual Nigeria and stuff but like I think they went to like the Ivory Coast and then they streamed all of that online as well so I think live streaming online it's a it's a good new platform because not everyone can make it to Coachella to see Beyonce but the um the impressions and social media that it gathered was great for Coachella and it just hypes up the brand and doing things online it's I think mm. I think it's the new way forward. I think the music industry is a little bit guilty of not uh, really fully grasping what they can do with brands in the tech space. Mm. So that's that's definitely our bad. Um, uh, but I think that's going to change pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, like the the only real big example is uh, Spotify and um, Warner and all the major labels have invested in Spotify, but I think they've sold a stake in it already, which is a might be a bit too premature. But they're very um, very cautious about working with tech brands because, to be fair, tech brands come and go. Like um, you could be hot one day and then the next day someone else comes along and it's bigger and better. So, I think for major labels um you you have to show them that you're worth the time and investment because like you said they get so many uh requests and they can partner with so many like you need them more than they need you sort of thing so that's that's something to consider but also like uh uh what was it american express unstaged was that it the city private pass like those you know, those types of brands that are just have like a music platform as a part of their marketing strategy. And so the, however they choose to bring music content or experience as technology changes, those are nice to see because they aren't uh, dependent on whatever the new technology is. They just update as the ability to bring music to people uh, outside of live. Um, they can just continue to, to change what they use to use it as a, a way to market to their consumers. So I think that's really interesting and probably the smart way to look at it as a brand, to actually build a platform and then use whatever tech um, and media platforms to get your message out there as possible. We, we, I had a call from Doc, we work a lot with Dr. Martins mm -hmm. and they're expanding rapidly in Asia. They'll open 25 stores in Japan this year, but they've built in their flagship store in Camden uh, a music venue essentially where bands go and play mm. and they wanted to know would we now expand the deal with our artists play there to allow them to stream those gigs to China mm. uh, and essentially we're probably going to put pressure on the labels to waive any fees for that mm. because it's going to give our a, a chance mm. to, to, yeah, to bring the artist music to the well, um, please join me in thanking the panel and do stick around if you'd like to meet any of them. We're going to go through that doorway just over there. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>